Well, what controls food webs? What controls the transfer of energy? What controls all those different things? And we want to look a little bit at some really new and emerging ideas um, that have to do with food webs and analyzing food webs because these ideas really relate to how we manage ocean resources, how we treat the ocean in a sense, and how we understand what's going on in the ocean and how we understand human impacts in the ocean. So what we're going to look at now is what kinds of factors control the transfer of energy and matter from lower trophic levels to higher trophic levels, what kinds of inputs control or regulate the transfer of energy from one trophic level to the next. And we'll examine in particular three different kinds and these three different kinds of um, controls, if you want to think about it that way, on food webs, on the transfer of energy and matter in food webs, are really kind of a new and emerging idea. And they're helping us again, as I said, better understand fisheries and fisheries management. They're better helping us understand the impacts of humans on food webs as well. So let's take a look at these three different types of controls on food webs. One is called bottom-up control. And in this control, the small control the very large. In other words, the productivity of phytoplankton is what controls how many fish or how many top predators there are on up the food chain. In bottom-up control, it's really as the phytoplankton go, so goes the rest of the food web. It's a kind of supply-side economics, it's been called. In other words, those, those things that we've talked about that control the growth of phytoplankton, light, nutrients, vertical mixing, seasonal variations, climate variations, upwelling, all those kinds of things. As the phytoplankton are stimulated to grow, or as things limit their growth, so too the things that eat the phytoplankton either grow more or are reduced. And the things that eat the things that eat the phytoplankton either are stimulated to grow more or their numbers are reduced. And the things that eat the things that eat the things that eat the things that eat the phytoplankton and so on and so forth may be increased in terms of their numbers in biomass if the phytoplankton are really going at it or if phytoplankton are limited then everything kind of dwindles down. So as the phytoplankton grow and reproduce so too does the rest of the food web and that's called bottom-up control. Well there's also evidence that top predators may exert control over food webs and this is called top-down control. Top predators in this sense and as we'll see in just a few minutes are the primary controlling mechanism over the populations and over the kinds of organisms that may be present in a particular food web. And there's also, some argue, a type of middle class or a middle control, a type of uh, organisms whose populations are controlled by environmental factors and their abundance controls both the levels above them, the top predators, or the levels below them, the lower trophic levels. And this type of food web structure and, and population control is called wasp waste control. Well, we can go to some figures in the book that better illustrate these three types of controls on ocean food webs. This is an example of bottom-up control. So here we have a food web with phytoplankton, zooplankton, planktivorous fishes, and top predators, and both in the forms of fish-eating birds as well as different kinds of marine mammals, and this may even have um, other kinds of fish in here, but for the sake of just uh, simplification, we're including just these four trophic levels. And again, as we know, physical and chemical processes, vertical mixing, availability of light, availability of biologically important nutrients, all the limiting factors that limit the growth of phytoplankton or stimulate the growth of phytoplankton, control the growth of phytoplankton, and as phytoplankton grow, as we see in this graph here, here's biomass versus time. So as phytoplankton increase, the things that eat the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, they increase. As the zooplankton increase in numbers in biomass, so too the things that eat the zooplankton increase in numbers in biomass, the planktivores. And when the planktivores are growing, 
and their biomass is increasing, so too then do the carnivores, the things that eat them, grow and increase in biomass. So here's an example of bottom-up control. In this type of food web, whatever happens to the phytoplankton is going to control the abundance of top predators. And as we'll see in a few minutes, some examples of ecosystems might be something like an upwelling ecosystem where you have a stimulation of a phytoplankton bloom as a result of upwelling of biologically important nutrients. And then when the phytoplankton goes, so do the zooplankton go. And when the zooplankton goes, so do the planktivorous organisms, and so on and so forth. A type of bottom-up control. In top-down control, it works a little bit like this. It's a kind of domino effect, if you want to think about it like that. Some physical or some human factors even may limit the growth of the top predators. It could be something like DDT, limiting the numbers and biomass of, uh, of fish. It could be a climate factor that limits the biomass of of fish eating birds or other kinds of factors that limit the numbers of marine mammals, other types of predators. When their numbers go down, then the things they eat are liberated from predation, so to speak, and their numbers go up. Planktivorous fishes will increase when we remove the top predators. As their numbers go up, well, then the things they eat are going to go down. The zooplankton will decrease in number. And of course, if there's fewer zooplankton, well then there's less grazing and predation on the phytoplankton, and the phytoplankton go up in numbers. So in this case, in top-down control of a food web, it's the activities of the predators that determine the concentrations of organisms at different levels in the food webs. And there may be some evidence that this is occurring right now. As we have fished out 90% of all the top predators in the world ocean, as we've removed the tuna and the marlin and the sharks and all the different kinds of large predatory fishes that normally feed in the world ocean, that normally exert top predator influences in the world ocean, we're seeing an explosion of organisms like squid, for example. There's some that even argue that squid are the new overlords of the ocean. Some would argue that squid now make up the largest biomass of any group of organisms in the world ocean. And if that's true, then it probably is a result of something like a top-down control over food webs where the elimination of predators has now allowed some other trophic level to grow and reproduce without limits on its growth. The final type of control on food webs is called wasp waste control. It's called wasp waste control because if you think of the wasp waste of a wasp, it's sort of um, V-shaped, right? Okay, it's like an hourglass shaped. And so it's that constriction in the middle that's growing, that's, that, this, that, um, that is illustrative of this type of control of a food web. In this sense, something like planktivorous fishes may be limited by some human or some chemical or physical factor. So, for example, an anchovy fisheries or a sardine fisheries or perhaps some climate change, some change in ocean temperatures, and we'll see that in just a few moments, um, may limit the growth of these organisms. Well, of course, if these organisms decline, then the things that eat them are going to decline. And of course, if they decline, then the things they eat are going to increase in abundance. And then if the zooplankton are increasing in abundance, the phytoplankton are going to decrease in abundance because they're being eaten by the more numerous zooplankton. But our examples here are illustrative of the way in which the abundance of organisms may change at different trophic levels as a result of some intervention, whether it's a natural intervention like a climate change or some other physical change in the environment, or even a human intervention. And it's really with an eye towards human impacts on food webs that we explore these three models here.